Sunday after New Year's Day, we remember more uh, that this is the second Sunday after Christmas. But these two thoughts meld in our service this morning as we take the thoughts that come to us as we mark time and think of how the Lord guided and directed the course of human events in the history in his story of this world. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, be present now. Our hearts in true devotion bow. Thy spirit send with grace divine, and let thy truth within us shine. Unseal our lips to sing thy praise. Our souls to thee in worship raise. Make strong our faith. Increase our light, that we may know thy name aright. Amen. We open with a New Year's hymn, Hymn 120, Help Us, O Lord, Behold We Enter. Thank you. 
Please follow the order of service as it is printed in our service bulletin. We worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Together, let us pray. Almighty God, merciful Father, we are sinful by nature and have sinned against you in our thoughts, words, and actions but we are sorry for our transgressions and pray you of your bountiful mercy to be gracious and merciful unto us. Forgive us for Jesus' sake, renew us by your spirit and lead us in the way everlasting. Amen. Jesus Christ is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. We are forgiven with, with boldness and confidence. We may approach the throne to find grace to help in time of need. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. <clears throat> The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we humbly bow before you. Thank you. Thankful for your forgiveness and that you have chosen us to imitate and follow your life and your suffering. We pray that your grace may give us the needed strength to do what is pleasing to you as you live and rule with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God forever. Amen. God is faithful to his promises. That was a lesson that Abraham needed to learn and that we also learn from Abraham. God fulfills his promises in his time, when he knows it is best. We read from the book of Genesis, the 17th chapter, beginning with the first verse. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you, and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your descendants after you and their generations. An everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Amen. Our gospel lesson for the second Sunday after Christmas is Matthew's record of God fulfilling his promises to send a Savior into the world. We read from Matthew's gospel, the first chapter, beginning with the 18th verse. 
Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took to him his wife, and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son. And he called his name Jesus. Here ends our gospel. We profess our Christian faith with the whole Christian church on earth. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We sing hymn 91, verses 1 through 5. Let the earth now praise the Lord. I'm 
Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for our sermon meditation on this the Sunday after New Year's is found recorded in Paul's letter to the Galatians. We read in the fourth chapter, verses 4 and 5. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. This is the word of God. Sanctify us, O Lord, through your truth. Your word is truth. Amen. In Christ Jesus, God, our Savior, who was born into the world, you feel the redeemed. Yesterday was New Year's Day. And what New Year's Day is all about is how we mark time for our lives. So much of what we take note of has to do with reviewing our past achievements or failures and our intentions to do better and accomplish more or experience different things in the coming year. We mark time according to our purposes in life. At the beginning of the year, we most often begin the new year with the best of intentions. Indeed, with determination that we shall make real progress in our personal life journey. It may be goals that we have in finances or health and fitness or well-being or hopefully some goals in our spiritual lives that we will do better in reading the Bible or being more active in church or, or memorizing scripture or reading our catechism or being more faithful with our home devotions or our prayer lives. Those are just a few suggestions from the pastor for what we might call New Year's resolutions. We all know that New Year's resolutions aren't so resolute as we would like them to be. I've been a lot less than resolute about losing weight and getting in shape than I ought to have been, even though it has been one of those things that I've put before me as the years come and go. So what about the Lord? How does the Lord do with the marking of time and his resolve to accomplish certain things? We know that the Lord's perspective on time is very different than our own. The Apostle Peter reminds us of this. Beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. But we should not imagine that this causes any kind of lack of resolve on the Lord's part. Quite the contrary is true. And the Lord's resolve is all about the salvation of sinners. So it is on this Sunday, right after New Year's Day, that we look at the Holy Spirit's lesson regarding God marking time according to his purpose. Sometimes we use that expression, marking time, for someone that is less than caring about what's going on in one's life, or for that matter, the world. They're just marking time. For the unbeliever, that is their concept of God's attentiveness to this world, to them. At best, they see God watching from a distance. And fairly impersonally, the world regards God as being a doddering old man who is very forgiving because he can't really keep track of all that's going on in the world anyway. Many like to suppose that he maintains a, a tolerance of people's imperfection. Because who can be perfect? That would be expecting too much. And really, people aren't all that bad, are they? 
Well, at least that's what most people like to tell themselves about themselves. To the world, God marking time is God watching as the world goes by. It is true that God's perception of time may be very different than ours since he is eternal and we are temporal beings whose reality is caught up in time. But that doesn't mean that time is meaningless to the Lord. In fact, the God of heaven is in charge of the earth. And he has done whatever he has pleased. So the psalmist tells us that doesn't reduce God to being impulsive or whimsical. In fact, quite the opposite is true. He's very purposeful. God was marking time, marking the events of this world which he had directed to this culminating event that it should happen when it was right, right for him, according to his purpose, which he had established in the wise counsel of God before time began. In the fullness of time, God sent his son. When we read this familiar passage, it speaks to us of the gracious purpose of God. The incarnation of the Son of God was not haphazard or by chance timing. God marked time, his time, in the world, in the history of this world. God had his time in mind when he would fulfill the promises that he made to the patriarchs. Then all the promises would be fulfilled. However, God marking time wasn't a matter of turning calendar pages either. He didn't sit back there at the beginning and say, well, let's wait 4,000 years, and when that much time has gone by, that, will, that sounds good. No, not at all. The God who made the earth as well as the universe not only watched the course of human events in this world, noting the sin of mankind, but God intervened in human events, guiding and directing events, the events of mankind to this central event in world history, the fullness of time was a matter of things being as they serve the Lord's purpose for sending his son into the world. Now, we kind of tend to look back in our history books and make observations about how different things were coming together that may have served the Lord's purpose. But at our best, our wisdom falls way short of comprehending the mind of God. We know from this specific passage that this was the right time, the time God comprehended as the fullness of time, when he would fulfill the promises made to the fathers, and God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. We recite those words quite easily, and may even say them without thinking about the profound truth these words express. If man were writing science fiction, Jesus' entrance into the world would be more like a Marvel movie. Jesus isn't a comic book superhero. Not in any way. Jesus is God taking upon himself our humanity. To do this, he was born of a woman. He was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He was and is fully human. He was and is fully God. That phrase, born under the law, is extremely significant. He was born under the law in the sense that as a human being, he was under the requirements of the law, all of them. 
He didn't get a pass or an exemption or an exception to certain requirements of the law. Theologically, we look at New Year's Day as the day of Jesus' circumcision. According to the requirements of the law, this holy child was also expected to endure circumcision. That eighth day of their lives was also the day in which children were named. And so the Son of God was given the name Jesus, for he would save his people from their sins. He was under the requirements of the law because it was necessary that all of the requirements of the law be fulfilled, be met by mankind. This Jesus did from day one. He did this to the very moment when he breathed his last at Calvary. We've been talking around it. Now let's get to it. God was marking time regarding the fulfillment of his purpose. What exactly was that purpose that was to be fulfilled in Christ Jesus? For believers like you and me, we aren't in great suspense. We know the answer. By the grace of God, we know the answer. His purpose? To redeem those under the law. We are the creatures who were under the law. That simply means that we aren't divine. God made us. We are part of his creation. We are the creatures that reminds us that, that we're not God. You know, God, he's the one that is over all. Part of being God, the all-wise God, is that that God establishes order for the good of his creation. He didn't do this because he thought it might be funny to, to see man struggle to do the things that God had established and wanted done. He established his law for our good and blessing. Part of being God is that he gets to make the rules because he knows how best to do it. Our flesh rebels at this because we want to make the rules for our own lives. Indeed, we want to make rules for the whole world. We like to think we know what's best. We like to think that we are the masters of our own destiny. What man has managed to do with man's ways is nothing less than a shipwreck. God was not fickle in establishing his law. He was loving and caring. And when Adam and Eve fell into sin and the will of man was corrupted and man was alienated from God, God did not abolish his law and he did not eliminate mankind. He responded in love and promised that the seed of the woman would come to crush the serpent's head and deliver man who through fear of death was subject to bondage and destruction from the curse of the law. When the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law. There was a debt that had to be paid. This debt was accrued by those under the law who in their stubborn arrogance thought themselves above the law and ended up owing God an eternity of suffering because of their sin. But then, that one who was above the law, the eternal Son of God, condescended to become one of us, to be born in the world and to live under 
the law that he might fulfill all the requirements of the law on our behalf and pay the debt we owed. He redeemed us to God. We had alienated ourselves from God. We are, were not children of God. We were children of wrath. It doesn't matter how many people think that by birthright we are all children of God. That's just not the truth. We are children of wrath. We are not children of God because of our sin. We were outcasts without any way of restoring ourselves to God's family. And yet, this was what God's purpose was in sending his son into the world. Jesus was born in Bethlehem for this very purpose, to redeem us, that we might receive adoption as sons. God chose us and adopted us into his family. What a marvel of grace that is. Please understand why this expression is worded as it is. This isn't disrespecting daughters. It is expressing the truth of the gospel in terms that the world understood. And that conveys to us the richness of God's grace. Being adopted as sons conveys our status regarding inheritance. Until very recent times in this world, Daughters didn't inherit, only sons did. If you watch some of those classic movies on TV or series, you, you get that. God wanted it understood that everybody inherits. Being adopted as sons conveys that thought to us. It is in regard to this that the scripture says, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs, according to his purpose. This special status came to us by God's grace through our baptisms, but it was secured for us by Jesus coming into this world, living under the law and fulfilling all righteousness for a fallen mankind and then taking upon himself our debt of sin, the curse of sin, the death of sin, and thereby redeeming us to God so that all of us might be heirs of eternal life. And so God's purpose in marking time was revealed for all the world in the birth of his son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the babe of Bethlehem. Now let us consider God's purpose and time going forward. Is God still marking time? Yes, absolutely. And it is still with purpose which is still God's desire for people to be saved. There is a time known to God the Father when this world, as we know it, will come to an end. And Christ shall return. And the world will face its judge. God is marking time. He is not forgotten. The world continues the world continues so that more and more people, people all over the world, might hear of how God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that people might hear and believe and be saved. Remember that passage that we read at the beginning of the sermon about God's perspective on time. Let's hear it again with God's purpose added on. Peter wrote, But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, 
but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now we live under this grace while the Lord is marking time. For us, it is a time of grace, a time for us to praise the Lord and glorify his name before the world. A time of grace for us to share this good news of Jesus' birth with others that they too might understand the real purpose behind God, which God fulfilled in sending his Son into this world. Let us redeem the time, making the best use of it. The time that God has given us so that we might serve his gracious purpose, living under this, this privileged status as children of God and heirs according to the hope of eternal life. In this new year, we may mark the time according to God's purpose and thank the Lord for the blessing of each day as we glorify Jesus as our Redeemer and Lord. Amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We pray. O oh Lord God, Father in heaven, you have shown us eternal love and mercy by sending your Son Jesus to redeem us from sin. We thank and praise you for this greatest of gifts and for the promise that whoever believes in him has eternal life. We ask that you would give us ever greater gifts of spiritual insight so that we may comprehend your glory and truth in Christ. Help us to receive him into our hearts by faith so that believing in him as the only Savior who took our guilt and punishment upon himself, we may always be counted as your sons and daughters and heirs of life everlasting. O God, bless your church the world over and endow all believers with power and zeal for your word. Strengthen us by dislodging the power and effect of sin in our lives and instead promoting humility and true godliness among us. Keep us steadfast in your words so that rejoicing in our certain salvation, we may glorify your name and show forth your honor and praise. Extend your kingdom, O Lord, over all lands and nations so that all may acknowledge your Son as Lord and Savior. We also pray that you would give righteous wisdom to all who rule over matters of this world, to our President and Congress, as well as to our state and local officials, so that we may be governed in peace, justice, and mercy. In all our homes, give parents grace and wisdom to bring up their children in the fear of the Lord which is the beginning of all wisdom. Dear God, be near to all who face temptation and to all who are in any peril of body or soul and grant to them a sure sense of your presence and grace in Christ. In these and in all other things of which we stand in need, give, O Father, your help and mercy. We ask it in the name of, of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. And we join in praying in Jesus' name. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
your offerings will be received by placing them in the, in the offering plate as you leave church this morning. And those that are joining us through our streaming services are encouraged to send their offerings to the Lord directly to St. Paul's Church at 2116th Street Southwest here in Austin, Minnesota. We will continue our service with the singing of hymn number 99, Now Are the Days Fulfilled. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. We close our service with the singing of hymn 97. Let us all with glad some voice Praise the God of heaven, who to bid our hearts rejoice, his own Son hath given. To this vale of tears he comes, here to serve in sadness, that with him in hands fair homes, Is not this a wonder? 
Sunday school and Bible class are in holiday recess, so there is nothing scheduled to follow the service this morning. Um, next Sunday is the first Sunday after Epiphany, so we're going to call it Epiphany Sunday. Um, and we have worship at 9.30. Sunday school is scheduled to follow the, the, uh, the service next week. However, we will not have Bible classes. We will be um, removing and, and storing away our beautiful Christmas decorations for another year following the service next Sunday. So um, your help on that would be appreciated. And um, catechism class is scheduled for next Sunday at 11.30. So that will be resuming at that time also. Um, please note in the, under future dates to remember that our annual voters meeting is scheduled for January 30th at 12.30 p.m. That means it's going to follow. There will be church, Bible class, potluck, and then our voters meeting on that Sunday. Are there any other announcements that should be made at this time? May the peace of the Lord be with you all and grant you all a most blessed and happy 2022.